Chuck. Hey. What's going on, dude? You good? Yeah, yeah. How are you? I'm all good. All good. I'm I'm happy to be finally making this happen, man. Thanks so much for doing it. Go on the farm. What's uh what's new? The last time we saw each other, we bumped into each other at the show you were playing with Tommy Guerrero at the the Macbeth pub in London. Um okay. I, I guess it was like a last minute kind of surprise special show after your jazz cafe headline. Uh, and that for me now feels like God. It feels like a lifetime ago, man. A different world. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's crazy. How have, time ago. how have you been filling your days for the last twelve months during these, you know, lockdown years? What have you been doing to stay sane? Um, I've been lucky to have a couple indoor skate parks close. So through the winters, you know, myself and my younger son, you know, we go skate and do that and music kind of got chopped in half as far as the the amount of places I was able to go to, you know what I mean? So everything just was kind of like, it felt like the dark age is happening again. It felt like being in a punk rock moment with, with all this technology, because you're just watching everyone just kind of like mentally burn into their position of being bored and not as creative as because of COVID, you know, it's kind of weird, you know? Yeah. You raise an interesting point there because I'm a touring DJ as well, and, and on the touring side of things, this year has completely stripped away, obviously, all form yeah. of, of income for most performers and musicians, and obviously mm. it's completely restricted any national and international travel. And so in many ways, there's like, you know, a lot to, a lot of hurdles. But as you say, in this world we're now in, I mean, this, what we're doing right now is one example of many, but I think with, with technology the way that it is, like for me, there's a lot of downsides to the internet and technology in this digital age, there is a lot of, of negativity there as well. But what it does allow you to do, if you come from a background like I do and like I know you do, where it is that DIY culture is embedded into us. Ah, oh, what's up? <laughs> How you doing? It's, yeah, it's, it's in the blood and it's in the DNA and it's in the, the brain, isn't it? That you're just going to get it done for yourself. If you have the tools, you're just going to yeah. get out there and make it happen. Yeah, that's all. I mean, it's all we have. I mean, it's all we've ever been exposed to, you know, being kind of involved with skateboarding and, and, and punk rock and, and kind of the newness of everything is 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 because it, we were all kind of starved for something different. Now it's you're kind of like starved for how, how healthy do you want to live your life? Do you want to take a risk? Certain people are just not risk takers. And when it comes to your health, it will make that person that's more closet bound to be that way because it's more of a mental risk, regardless of the risk you have to do being in public anyway. But now that it, it, I feel sketchy when I see more than six or seven people skate and I won't even go in, you know what I mean? And I'd never would do that before. I would I'd go into a place that was there was beer on the floor and it, it just, we just didn't care, you know. Mm -hmm. Even a year ago, we were at a fest in Phoenix, Arizona. And everybody was all over each other, even though they knew that COVID was in Europe. No one expected it to be in the States until March 7th. You know, so it was just like, you know, basically March 13th. So basically from March 7th, which is my youngest son's birthday. Right. We were saying hi to each other, shaking hands on March 13th. They were shutting LA down completely. So I never, never seen, to me as an artist, anything, you know, I've never gone through anything like this. I don't know when, what, this is even doing to us well a couple of things there that that spring to mind for me like the ptsd of this thing is concerning we won't yeah. linger on this too much of course but just to catch up and set the, set the tone and stuff but you, you kind of raised the point there of like when these rules are in place and these regulations are in place and these these paranoias and fears for right reasons settle in i wonder how long it'll take us to get back to Oh, I'm just going to go to a show and put my arms around a stranger again and not yeah. bug out in my head about catching something from them. Yeah, that's it's where the not, risk, isn't it? Yes, that's where the risk comes in. The risk takers. 
you know, because it's like, you know, I've just, I was just recently in Florida and people there are just more open. I mean, the, the, the numbers are higher there, but people are still existing. Like Florida's never really shut down through this whole COVID situation. You know? mm-hmm. it's like it's, it's amazing that some people will just say, let me just push it and see where, where I end up. And there's some truth to that also. I, we, were, we just had our mask on. I, I was there with a friend of mine, G Love. We were, you know, just doing some events and having some fun. But we were the only people around that were just really caring about like, hey, we should just keep ourselves a little bit more self-contained. People down there just, nah. Fuck it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're living, which is, God bless them, you know what I mean? You know, we're all going to go somehow. I don't know. But just the whole health, the, the, the upper respiratory thing is, this is the first time everyone has the same risk as a regular asthma patient. This is yeah. what we do. I'm an asthma patient. So. Right. Excuse me, stuttering, but this is what we deal with all the time. Our lives are just up and down with upper respiratory. But now everyone is subjected to it because of COVID. It's kind of sad because a lot of people aren't ready to even deal with the fear or the anxiety of not being able to breathe or, you know, as an asthma patient, you have to go through a lot and learn a lot. So you, 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 we become our own CPR type of people. And for people that don't know that, someone that just all of a sudden gets that upper respiratory shock, it could be, that's why people are dying more out of shock. Than, yeah, and panic. Yeah, they don't know what to do. You know yeah. what I mean? You have to, as an asthma patient, you have to know how to, to survive. You need to know what to do in all situations. So when you were growing up and you were getting into skateboarding, did you always have asthma? And was it always like a yeah. an it was, issue? It, it, it was it was, <clears throat> it was just always pertaining to my diet. Right. And because I was eating things that weren't agreeing with me, you know, mainly dairy and wheat. And so when I would normally catch a flu or catch a bug, you know, I would get sick, but I would I would have a lot of inflammation, how I understand it now. Because if I were to do that now, how I used to eat when I was 13 or 14, I'd fall over. You know what I mean? So I've just I've learned how to keep things cleaner for me. Where did you grow up, man? Did you grow up in Philly or did you move there like a little later in life? I was, uh, started in Wilmington, Delaware. Right. And uh, I was there living there with my father and my mom always lived in Philadelphia. So like around age, say, six or seven, I started. I remember just going back and forth because there was a lot of music fest in Philly back in the day. There was a lot of street people playing music. It was way more unified, you know, and it was the start of hip hop and graffiti. Mm. So most kids in Delaware wanted to, you know, go to South Street and be around like Schooly D and all these other people that were just learning how to, you know, take this subculture. And especially skaters because we were always on the street anyway. So it was kind of kind of wild growing up in Delaware and Philadelphia because you know parents made decisions to move. So Schooly D, you mentioned there. Obviously, you wound up later on working with him. But was yeah. he like an early guiding light for you when it came to creativity and music? Was he one of the first artists <laughs> that you were aware of? Like, okay, he's doing something exciting. I'm into this. Yeah, like it brings smiles. Like this is like remembering like how basic shows were and. Oh, that's so, that's Chris Schwartz, you know, like who managed Schooly and Chris now, you know, is a big famous, you know, like kind of record producer person. But it's just crazy that we were all in Philadelphia and I heard him as a kid, you know, you know, his singles, PSK and all that stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just unified everyone in, in, in the hood per se, but it, it, it did reach skateboarding, you know what I mean? And then to finally get to work with him and to see that and hear him talk about how we made that beat and how we created this whole persona of who he was. It's pretty cool that he did that in Philly. I mean, he, he had to live that to do it because Philadelphia was pretty rough back then. Well, he, people associate gangster rap with obviously the West Coast and L.A. in particular. But I guess that tune was was kind of the first example of that, wasn't it? Yeah, Hugely totally. influential. Yeah, he was the first, that, the first to really come out with some braggadocious thing that was connected to philadelphia other than like the cheese steak or like the pretzel you know what i mean yeah like yeah, yeah the most but what he was talking about is what he's seen his uncles and fathers and their brothers and people you know aunts. i mean there's a lot of people tied up into this way of life and it's just philadelphia's a rough town if you don't know how to deal with that type of personality because people who don't like to be tested you know what i mean so i think that school he was able to take that character and put it into his first really unique songs. I mean, like his singles, you know, it was amazing that he tapped into the subculture of what was just being discovered, like hip hop, you know what I mean? Yeah, man. 
and people talk about what they think. At that time, you obviously had a New York was huge for it, and again, people go to New York more often. But you know, I mean, for you, how do the the kind of the subcultures and the the different lanes which you were obviously operating in all come together of skateboarding and music and then with obviously within music you had hip-hop but also hardcore uh, how, what was the unifying thread that brought all those things together for you was it just street culture and all of it existing on the street around you well um <clears throat> a part of growing up in philly is you kind of get to hear a lot of different music jazz new metal whatever and then you get to see these people around, so you get a little bit more of a lead into what it would kind of be. Some of these band are, bands aren't as big. So the influence is there, but basically I, think, I just think that everything just happens for a reason. It's just that the style of how people appreciate music in a subculture of like skateboarding and punk rock, it, it just it lends itself to be a little bit more minimalistic, but has this really big anthems, and these anthems that like just so-called last for a long time because people have we have memories of what we're doing you know what i mean and i don't know if i'm really kind of answering your question but i think the crossroads of anything creative especially with young people there's always there's always need for a soundtrack and yeah. if the people that are part of it can create it you know what i mean because like woodstock they had huge they had huge stars like most of the people in skateboarding and punk rock and hardcore even chrome max like they all were just basic you know, just local bands playing like five dollar shows. You know what I mean? Like putting this message out there, like, look, we're going to be here forever. You know what I mean? And I guess as well, skating was the thing, right? Like, because yeah. skating when it started was was soundtracked by hardcore and hip hop and punk yeah. rock and metal, and there wasn't necessarily like genre boundaries. It was just if yeah. it was, if it was fresh and like aggressive and exciting, mm -hmm. then it was all good. Yeah, and and also politics were just entering. Like skateboarding a little bit more visible you know what i mean people starting to have a little bit more of a, a reach out of what they would think or what they would say or what they you know stand for you know what i mean and i think that's great too i just think that the lifestyle of skateboarding is so unique that whatever it's kind of like kind of meshed up with it's always one you know what i mean it's just crazy especially with hip-hop skateboarding and hip-hop just it gave hip-hop a whole another breath of life you know you know like a guy like hobson who was an amazing mc is on stage skating, like, you know, tray flipping or whatever, or showing people that he still has skill and still loves skateboarding as much as being this personality with a microphone, which takes a lot of work. You know, it's not an easy job to do. Yeah, it's interesting as well, I think, because I'm sure they're out there. But for me, I've never met like a racist or a homophobic skater because yeah. skating always seems to be a culture of acceptance. <laughs> and, and, and different people and like i said i'm sure they exist but it's yeah, like yeah, obviously yeah, within yeah. punk and hardcore you had a certain faction of the skinhead crowd which brought with it its own animosity and whatever but i don't know man, maybe you can school me like was skating always in your experience this very multicultural accepting tight-knit but extended family i think for me um i don't like if how I look at look the skating is because we were spoiled by all the like kind of indoor and outdoor skate park parks in the seventies. And then for some reason that did, just didn't hold up for a business reason, but like there was all this like need for us to be like spoiled, but it seemed like, I don't know this once, once it kind of got down to the, the root of it, you know what I mean? It's just, it's, I don't know. Could you give me the question one more time just so I can get back on what I was saying, because I just wanted to, no worries. I was just asking you if you encountered any racists in the skate scene. Oh no, yeah, yeah. Out, or whether yeah. it was always just all love and all good and No, yeah, like see, it's it gets it gets weird. Like I knew guys and I, I knew people that I skated with and, and and were interacting with in this kind of like broken down world of skateboarding. Because when it was big, when Tony Alba was big and all those guys, it, it wasn't really concentrated on it. had to kind of break down and, and people had to start going into neighborhoods where men have been safe you know what i mean like because that's where all the ramps were they weren't in the yeah. inner city the kids weren't doing that you know so there was a couple of things that were there but it's i think that skateboarding i don't want i, I know of one because i got a phone call from a, a good friend of mine by the name of peanut brown and it was something that went down between him and jason jesse and you know this was luckily a contest that, that I, i'm glad that i wasn't there because i grew up with peanut as a kid 
and it would have upset me that if someone said something to him that was racist because as long as I've been in skateboarding, even if I saw it or felt it, no one's really said that. They may have said it about the, the music that was because I put on some reggae, you know, or somebody said, what is that? You know, they just, and then made a comment and, and, and tagged a little like character, word character to it. You know, it just, it's, that's only, that's what's only happened to me. But I've been able to go and skate spots and I've, I've, I can see it. You can, you can, you can feel it. You can, when people breathe a little bit of that ignorance, you know, it's just like, it sucks that it's attached to hate because hate's so physical. Yeah. I, I consider like pork is the same way as racism. Pork to me is, is, is the same thing as it comes from the same, like unbalanced place. If you, you, if you digest too much of it, it just doesn't work out. You know what I mean? I just wish, to, I know that people are not going to get along regardless of skin color. It's just that it's just, that's how I looked at it. You know what I mean? I, I've been chased by black people. I've been chased by crazy, you know, white people. It doesn't matter. I mean, we're all a little out there. I mean, I put, we put ourselves out there knowing that we're, we could not come home on it. You know what I mean? It's just, it has nothing to do with racism. I, I wish that I could say that we were trying to weed things out. Like the biggest thing that I dealt with was when, when Peanut called me from, the contest and said, yo, I just got into it with Jason Jesse and he said this. And I was like, man, I'm so glad that I wasn't there. I would have lost my mind. You know, because it's just, it's unnecessary that you have to think more impact like that. But when we, when you grow up black and you're always used to hearing that word and it comes out when you're in, a, in an aggressive moment, anyway, skating, you don't want to hear something derogatory about where you come from. I mean, it's already on people's shoulders, you know, because a lot of people aren't educated about black people. And a lot of black people are uneducated about white people. You know what I mean? It's like, just to get down to the basics of it, that's not even thinking about any other nationality. Just the, the two sides in 2021 are still trying to figure each other out. Like there's some mystical side of the black person. It's a mystical weird side of the white person. That's the only thing I'm tripping about because I've been influenced by both styles of people. So I'm, I'm a little, I know that I'm going to catch some flack even as an artist because art is not even be being accepted in society anymore. No one's even talking about if we can save the arts through COVID. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, you know, jobs and positions and people who really need that support or dedicate their time to, to that, that cause. I've, I've seen it happen before in the Philadelphia school system where they cut a lot of the arts because they can't facilitate what's going on. I just hope that we, as artists, I'm focusing more on writing and being more like theater about what I'm doing with my music and skating right now, because I know that things could get tight. You know what I mean? Things could get a little crazy due to the circumstance of this is all new to everyone. You know, I'm just trying to hold on. I mean, the racism is a part of what people are seeing because the phone and people like to, you know, record, but there's, it's it, Jerry Springer happened so, to me, society into that thing about I got to see it. I got to be a part of it. And the phone is, is it's unlimited. So racism now, the minute you say it, it goes, whoa, like quick, so quick. Before the incident had to happen and five, 10 people hear about it, then they either try to squash it or do whatever. Now something can go viral just when someone just texts. They could be drunk texting something and put it out by dumb mistake. You know what I mean? Not that I'm trying to cover for anyone that's racist, but you know. What you're saying is it can go it can go far fast, and that's yeah. that's a good thing because it can expose, as you say, like a hate crime. But also at the same time, it's like anything can be taken out of context and yeah. ran with, and yeah. you're like, "Fuck." <laughs> that to me is bigger bigger than racism because I mean, I think people are just not going to get along anyway. So if you take away racism, the human to me, the human mind is going to find something else to kind of fix on to see what if there's a battle or not. You know what I mean? And, just the racism thing has been happening for so long and it sucks that people are just getting mangled. And I, you know, I've been profiled myself, but I kind of shook it off. You know what I mean? I, and my son was with me. He witnessed for the first time two cops racially profiling me and him, you know? But I stuck myself in that situation, going to see my friend at the beach. Like, I didn't think anything about it. Like, he kept warning me, like, yo, watch your ass, come, you know? And so I think we all have to take a risk in society, it sucks that like certain people just don't like someone of the, the color of their skin. But the, the, the word racism to me is just becoming more of a lifestyle versus like 
what's going to take to br really break it down and then give human beings something else to complain about each other. That's on the same level as a racist, racist person or I hate racist people. You know what I mean? That's a big thing to like take away from the psyche and then what are you going to fill it with? You know what I mean? Where does all that anger go? You know what I mean? Like it's just... Well, not to read too much into it, but for me, what's always been interesting about a culture like skateboarding is it's not designed to encourage competition like if mm. if you're competing it's in a healthy positive way so it's not about hating the other guy who's on the other team or trying to mm. you know attack that guy from the other team it doesn't be that um sorry build that kind of like team sports rivalry mentality which yeah. i think as you say that transcends any kind of like oh he's a different ethnic minority to me or they worship a different god to me it's just like that's the enemy whoever they may be you know they're in my way get out the way and what's rad is that skating was just like we're, we're here together let's make the most of this space and do something cool with it and, yeah. and enjoy yeah. this moment in time yeah and, and, and we had to create it and that's the, the coolest thing about it it wasn't made for us it's kind yeah. of like yep. but the brotherhood in skating took on different things there's, there's so many different levels to it you know that's why i said the racism was to me, a small thing inside of it, you know what I mean? Because all the friendships and the, you know, road trips and skate parks and people telling people about secret spots. I mean, there's, people still enjoy themselves through all those dark years, even before people had cell phones, you know what I mean? It wasn't, you know, I mean, I know Ray Barbie got chased once and it was a horrible situation for him and it wasn't his fault. He just caught the wrong environment that day, you know what I mean? As far as his energy was out there and all of a sudden the forces were out there and they, it, I mean, he had to run into a church to, he had ran for his life, you know what I mean? So we all have different experiences, you know what I mean? And I, I would be petrified if I had that. And I'm glad I never had. I've seen it in hardcore shows, but I've also had 20 of my friends with me, you know what I mean? So it wasn't, and it was multicultural, you know what I mean? They weren't. It's just weird how how, how that's, that thing comes. It just seems like it's, it's just people against people at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, like if there were 100, 100, could they roll up in wheelchairs and would it be just as effective? You know, everyone's got to walk and be, you know what I mean? It's just weird. That's what I'm saying. It's like the, I'm just pulling away from it because skateboarding to me gave me so many, it gave me a lot of different options to, to, to forget about racism, to put something in a, in the place of racism that needed to be created, like skateboarding, the arts with the music, the friends, you know, taking a, you know, taking a chance and going out the, out west when you've never been there. You know, like, how's this gonna work? And then it works. I mean, most people really don't do that, you know what I mean, for something. What took off first for you, like the music or the skateboarding in terms of the success that you started to enjoy? Or did they both um, correlate and, and kind of start, you know, kicking off at around the same time? Music was first. My dad played. He was a sax player. He had a band. And so I jammed with him. So it was more like a fun thing. Like I'd be able to go out and play marbles and do whatever and run around. And then, you know, age six, I'm, you know, jamming with these, you know, grown, grown up people having fun. Age then, six. Yeah. And then wow. age eight, they had me do my first show. You know, gave me two songs and two drum solos. And, you know, I mean, just. And it was cool because they were, they were professional guys and I was able to learn from it. I, I liked it because of my, what I learned hearing, being in the middle of all that as a drummer, as a, I could still remember the vibrations going like, wow, these guys really know what they're doing. And, and as a young person, you know, it's just a, a grom looking at like, you know, Pedro Bar's skate or something, you know, it just, it's mind boggling, but a part of you wants to learn that process. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, what yeah. I like. So that's what I, my father had me kind of like, fly on the wall learning and then once i was able to have my own bands i tried to emulate what he did with his his bands what was your first group um my first group was uh was called jerry's kids it was with uh, some friends of mine in delaware there's another jerry's kids that's from boston we were from like wilmington area and just kind of a cover band and then when I moved to Philly, I started another band with some friends out of Jersey called New Jersey's Finest. It's kind of a hardcore oi type band. Yeah. And then soon after that, like 83 is early, early 83, McRad started. But that was because of the, the skateboard connection between myself and Zeke. We skated Cherry Hill together as kids. 
So he was already in a band named F called FOD. And then he decided, Chuck, let's, let's start a band and let's make it about skateboarding. You know, yeah, skateboarding. yeah. Let's that record's from. killer, man. There's there's some amazing tunes on there which still like they kind of take you back to that time and place and vibe and energy with the sound. When you hear him, you're like, oh man. For me, it just brings back like pure, I don't know, untamed energy and nostalgia like weakness, McShred, weak <laughs> style. Like it's killer stuff. How important mm. were the bad brains to you as like an aspiring drummer in particular, but just like, you know, punk fanatic and hardcore musician? What was the, the impact of that band on that scene at that time? Yeah, Bad Brains um, were an influence through my friendship with Tom Graholsky. And we, after our, our local park, it shut down. I just turned 16, just getting my license. Um, I think probably that falls when we had to, I had to drive basically to Philly to North Brunswick, which is an hour and a half, almost two hour drive with traffic just to go skate because the convenient part of having a skate park wasn't there anymore. It was backyard. So since Tom was always listening to the music and he was in the punk music, I would ask him questions like, yo, if you see an all black punk band, you know, let me know. And then I come up one time and he shows me the pay to come 45. And when I put it on, I was just, I, I lost it. Because music, from a music standpoint, watching my father and, and their band, it was like everything that they did, it was sped up, like, you know, putting a, a record on 45 when it should be on 33. Just mm -hmm. five brains did everything like a, like a, a well-seasoned musician, but at the tenacity and, and, and the speed of like a punk rock band. And that had never been done before, period. And so their influence, from a skateboard connection was amazing. And then their influence by me playing drums with those guys and becoming mentors of like Doc and Daryl and, and meeting Israel and, and, and knowing more history. To me, I was learning and also helping them keep the brand alive. You don't, you don't want a band to not tour when they have options too. And that's what I thought it was. I never thought that I was replacing somebody in the band, like Earl and Mackie are way too important. Bad Brains are just one of the, to me, it's a clever friendship that turned into a whole university of like, you know, music. If you pick any musician in that band and wanted to emulate their style, you're going to come out a better musician. And then songwriting as, as a team is completely out of control because they all did write songs and they all did play each other's instruments. You know what I mean? It was cool. It's a one of a kind situation with a band. And a lot of people don't know the inside guts of the history. They just know the, the rebel, you know, band in DC thing. They don't know like these guys are just kids. Yeah. You know? Well, and and they like they slowed it down and they brought in, you know, Rastafarianism and like heavy low end reggae, didn't they? And th I think they were always like three steps ahead of everyone else in the hardcore scene. I'm reading no, Harley Flanagan's book at the moment, and he's you know he's going on and on in that about just the impact that that band had on New York. Like New York had its CBGBs thing obviously going on. And then as that was evolving into more of a street punk style and then hardcore, they thought, oh, we're kind of the forefathers of this. And then <laughs> Bad Brains come in and they're like, oh, no, these guys are like light years ahead. <laughs> and that was right at the start before they even went and started doing the jar stuff and, and everything yeah, else. Yeah, 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 it's raw. So raw. Happy we have that for our genre of music. It's kind of weird to say that, but it's a one of a kind situation. How did you get to know them? How did that connection first, you know, begin? Um, HR, when I was about like, like around 19, gave me a call and said, hey, do you want to come open up, you know, for my new band? And that was when he had HR and company, you know, like the Happy Birthday, My Son, and a, a couple of other, like, classic songs from that era. But it was HR's first time stepping out outside of Bad Brains to do his own thing with friends of his in D.C. and also his brother. So from that connection, I kind of just stayed in touch with the band and met Doc and Daryl, you know, once I started playing in, in New York more. I was playing with his band Underdog. And so everyone in New York was always walking around and going to each other's shows. And so I met those guys then. But they just happened to want to audition me for a singer. So I tried it and didn't, it came close, but it wasn't, I couldn't fill the shoes of singing on the new record but I was able to come back as a drummer because Mackie wanted to take a leave. So I just stepped in and, you know, 
did what I had to do. <laughs> it's funny. It's a heavy situation. There's a lot of learning. Those guys are really super, super important people of like how they love music without any of the fame attached to it. Like fame, fame has nothing to do with how big that they are, how big they are, you know what I mean? As far as how they put their music together and why they wrote it and why they went from being a mid-tempo band to a fast thing. It's all out of just whack. Just playing and playing and playing and maybe more frustration or more anxiety. It wasn't, you know, oh, we're going to get faster now. But bands make clear decisions now to do what they're going to do in music instead of letting it become more of an art form. Yeah, they're often like driven by the need or the want for capital, aren't they? And financial yeah. gain. And that's, that's often what's steering the creative choices is what can we do differently to make more money? Whereas yeah, with a band well, like that, you know, it's purely and simply the, the art form and the creativity itself, which is dictating the situation. Yeah. I mean, the financial gain of it is, is one thing, but I've, I've actually seen people become rigid within, the, within themselves thinking that just their tour is like, and this is no slag to anyone else that like, that if you're on a 30 day tour and you're doing 28 shows of those tours, that I feel that it's theater and you should give people a different show each night, but certain people just want it so rigid that to me, I wouldn't even remember, I wouldn't want to remember a tour like that because it doesn't, I don't feel like I'm giving people who paid money a real show. I've, I've lucked out and been able to be on tour with people that are like, they like to express that. And, and Doc and Daryl, they, those guys really, really showed me how to put that on another level, just energy wise, without even saying a word, just all about like, if you're gonna play your instrument or think about your music, you know, make sure you analyze it and go through it and play it and make sure you feel right. You know, It's just a different whole concept. It's not about who can play faster or better. It's all about how much energy can you put inside what you're doing and kind of almost make it, it, it make it explode. Yeah, I wish I could have seen them back in that time, like, you know, HR doing the backflips and stuff and just um, physically speaking by all accounts, those shows just obviously you're talking music, but they were just, you know, out there, but just from a physical performance point of view, they, they sounded like the most ferocious band in town, just yeah, like true. completely uncompromising, relentless. Mm -hmm. It was that, I mean, like the, where they were coming from, it wasn't a place of lack even though they weren't backed by just some crazy money machine. It was just about like, I guess because they grew up with records like with Michael Jackson and everything else. So their mental state was like, if you're gonna play basketball, you wanna be like Dr. J or Kareem or Michael Jordan. You wanna go and think for the top. Punk rock people were going like, we kinda of wanna be like Sid Vicious and Johnny Rotten. And not that those guys were crap musicians. It just wasn't on the level of like, well, what if a really good musician does that and makes it unbelievably aggressive? And that's where you, you get the bad brains, you know what I mean? It's like they just lucked out and they didn't make it cheesy. You know, it was all about being political. And it's hard for bands to survive when they're highly testing the system and they sound amazing. You know, it's a, it's a lot. Was it a volatile unit to be in the center of, like, or, or was the creative energy enough to kind of keep the, the band focused and centered because you do hear the stories that it's, you know, quite a, a stormy environment being in, in the, the ship, Bad Brains. <laughs> <laughs> what was your yeah, experience yeah. of rolling with them and touring? Yeah. Just on a personal level. No, yeah. Emotions run, run, run high. I mean, basically HR had put himself to where he wasn't living like he is now because you know, HR is a really good friend of mine. He's, we talk all the time and, I've watched him kind of pull himself the last, it was like 2012, where he was kind of pulling himself out of the darkness of like, hey, I can't stay where I'm staying anymore. I got to get more into like writing. So that's why I was there for the writing part of it. And what I saw out of what was, what was being created in front of me was almost like HR like just happened to get, get fallen into punk rock but mentally his mind wasn't there. So he's still got that guy, he's still gotta be the guy who does the backflips on stage and da, 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 da. And most people think that he gave, gave that up as an old person, like in his fifties. I think it was given, I think he gave it up around 85, 84. I think it was 
just trying to be that person where you're testing your body all the time didn't work out. Plus, he had mental things he was dealing with. Like maybe it was cool because they never really toured that long. You know, it would be it's hard to hold that that pressure up. That's why it was so emotional because it, the content is highly emotional, and then the energy is highly emotional. You know, it's just it's, and if you don't have a, a strong, healthy backbone of getting all your ailments taken care of. You're going to break down so that's why at their most important moments and i've seen a couple it, it's for some reason there's just an energy that comes in and boom and then you're in the middle of it but i've i've seen hr really recover and save his life and that to me like after people were kind of forget, giving up on him he's now a, a completely a better person he's got like a whole new project he's got a new record you know he's he's living better eating better he's still singing you know, it's it's a, it's a lot different than. I don't know why we, they couldn't get him the right help. I just think that everybody has to come to their their burning. You know what I mean? And it's because it's a heavy thing. Because once again, he's just he's just a guy to all these people. He's, yeah, he's the, there's a pressure there, isn't there? Yeah. So why wouldn't that be wavy? If you were the guy that went on to do backflips all the time, you know, twenty years from that or whatever, ten years from that, you're like. Just that I've pressure. I've done enough but, backflips, guys. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, but it's crazy, you know, that's, and, and that's what a part of, now that I'm really now realizing with HR, you know, his real name is Paul. When I'm really like, well, HR was just one of the characters that he was developing through him being like chemically imbalanced. But he, for some reason, did a great job just micromanaging it and not being healthy. It's hard to keep everyone together. And that's what the band had and the management had to realize. It's not about that he had evil thoughts in his mind. It's just that his health was not up to where his madness was. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't, you can't vibrate at that energy and expect to hold everything together. You know what I mean? It's just. I think the scene at the inception and early stages as well of, of hardcore and probably of skating is. It attracted quite a a fringe type of person, didn't it? A lot of street kids, a lot of like outlaw personalities. And I think with that comes a certain amount of baggage sometimes. You know, maybe they've grown up hard and, and they've had to grow up fast. And, you know, these terms that we're now more used to when talking about mental health and, and things like that, that wasn't really, you know, in the conversation back in the 80s, was it? So no, no, you no. Just, you kind of just accept their behavior as eccentric and part of it, and yeah, because it's like it's it's in the, in most of the cities things were undeveloped. You know what I mean? It was just like because you know you you as a young kid you tour cities, even skating or playing music, and you see how cities have grown. Everything back in the eighties was just more raw. You know what I mean? So it's just going for it. You know what I mean? Making it make make it a rea- making it a reality. I don't know if I answered the situation or the question. I kind of spaced out again. It's all good, Chuck. We're just jamming. Listen, let me ask you this: How important is Joe the Butcher as a figure in your life? <laughs> and, and when does he come in? <laughs> Joe's Joe's um like eighty nine. I uh, recorded a record uh, called Dreaming for Caroline Records, and I was out in L A. and I met a sax player named Jay Davison. And I, I, I wanted to get into doing more session work, like on another level, outside of punk bands or reggae bands or ska bands, which I was having fun doing that. And I still do that. But I wanted to start getting placed on some records. So I met this guy, Jay. He was playing sax for Cinderella. So I was like, oh, OK, you're from Philly. I'm from Philly. Hey, when you get back, give me a call. I'll bring it out in the studio. That's what Jay's telling me. So I go down there, and, and luckily, they need a bass player for a session and I can play bass and I can play drums and guitar, but you know what I mean? I'm able to just be completely strong on bass and drums. And I wanted to get that excitement and then like, can I handle cutting someone's record and, and, and just kind of being out of the way. It's not about me. It's just about making sure the final product sounds good. And, and it worked yeah. out really good. I mean, there's been some humiliating moments in it, but it's been super, super, super. You know what I mean? It's fun. Is this fun. where a lot of the? I mean, what was the label that he that he owned that signed Cypress Hill and stuff? Huge uh, label, Rough House. 
So yeah. was was a lot yeah. of the projects that you got involved in around that time, like the Goats album, um, Schooly D, The Roots, was a lot of that stuff through Joe and through Rough House um, and that Philadelphia connection, or was the it Roots, a- the Roots were through David Ivory, who was uh, had a studio over in uh, Sigma in uh, Philadelphia. Sigma Sound was on like 12th Street, and so the Roots were working with him, and Amir and I were friends, and. Uh, they were tracking a record and the goats were already together you know signed a rough house and kind of hitched on the sony a little bit i don't think it was a full ride yet so the roots were putting their band together they needed a keyboard player so they grabbed the keyboard player mark boyce from the goats and myself and said hey come in the studio and play this and that's where i met david ivory and that's where you get the first roots record and me just collabing with those guys because they needed that for the sound of what they were doing so it was cool Joe was responsible for putting me on the Billy Joel song, River of Dreams, have the play bass on that and a bunch of other things and asking me to join. How much Joe. fun was that? The River of Dreams session was fun. It was cool. He, Billy Joel wasn't there. It was just that we were doing a remix. You know, he, Billy was in some other personal situations at that time. So it was just trying to record a record everywhere. And we got into doing the remix, and the remix happened to be the single of the record, which I've never heard that happen. You know, remixes always come after the single. You know, yeah, it's we, like B-side material, isn't it, or bonus tracks? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just a fun thing if you collect those B-sides. But it was cool to see just the excitement of a bunch of grown folks in the studio, and me being the young buck, the skateboard punk rock guy. Like I just saw these heavyweights come in and be like, yo, Billy Joel tracks coming in. We got to pull out all the stops. So it was like every person that was a badass and that I was a part of their team, when I saw those guys showing up, I was like, okay, this is, this is, an, this is an opportunity because there was no money guaranteed. It was a pure excitement of just working with Billy Joel. So that's, I like that part of it. Sometimes when the artist is there, you can't control the moment that they're in. So, and I'm more stoked on the musician side of it. Like, can we really, you know, play and do something better than the original song? Because they did a great job with the original song. Just for some reason, what we did made, made more sense. So I'm happy that we're part of it. What's going on with the skating whilst the music is becoming, you know, more prolific and you're working more in the studio? Are you having to take your foot off the gas with skating and doing tours and, 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 you know, doing it at that professional level, or are you able to juggle the two and just go hard at it with both lanes? I just kind of, you know, skate when I can. This last year and a half has been a lot more, you know, going to different parks and because things have been shut down. So tours have been more spread out or, or events because everything hasn't really lined up as a tour yet. So I mean, I kind of like it now having more time to skate and, and the same amount of playing music. Certain tours before, when you, as I said before, if it was a 30 day tour and you're playing 28 shows and your day off is a travel day, you know, and the other day is just kind of like, you know, a pack, pack down day. You know, you don't really get a chance to do it with doing six hour drives a day. It depends on how your tours routed. And back then they would just put bands out and, and you'd hit it as hard as you could. I mean, they, they put you out until you just burned out. You know what I mean? It was endless. You know what I mean? That's, that's over. They, that don't, I don't think that'll ever come back. It's consistent. Bang, 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 bang. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's too many risks, you know what I mean? Because it's, it's dirty with people. It's, it's, tours are dirty. You know what I mean? You have to be, everyone has to be I'm unbelievably into being clean. And that's hard. A lot of people just like being themselves. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a rough thing, you know. I, I I wish it was like it was before because it's it, I, I miss seeing certain people and then getting a chance to play music, you know, around my friends and seeing their bands and that that that, that part of it sucks. Were all your skate friends super happy for you as they started to see, you know, your music career, if we want to use that evil corporate term? But were they stoked for you and, you know, it all started kicking off and you're playing on Billy Joel records and stuff like that? Because <laughs> there can't have been many people on the skate scene that were getting to, you know, say yeah, that they're jamming yeah. with Billy Joel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the support has always been there. It's just that I, I know that with, with skating, it was hard to kind of like 
take any Billy Joel press of what I was doing with Joe the Butcher and merge it into skateboarding because the hip hop side of skateboarding really wasn't developed at that time. I mean, it was there, you know, with Cypress Hill a little bit, but it wasn't as, it's just, it, it was different conversations I knew that I should have with the things that I, that I have to create with people. Just because I've done some with Billy Joel doesn't mean it's going to resonate as, 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 as high or as hard with the skateboard community because they're not. Like maybe now because people have grown up with it. Mm. But most of the people that I skated with didn't really, unless they love Billy Joel, didn't want anything to do with the type of music. Yeah. So, so, so I. Was it hard I, operating both worlds? Did you find sometimes you were a bit lost in the middle or was it cool? I thought it was cool just to kind of be, be challenged to to be amongst thought process of like, well, just because it's on a major label and this was a big star, that it means more than the person who's in their basement, which I've been like making a record that comes from your heart. And I've seen both results. I mean, one does one fine on, on, on a financial level and, and one can not do one, but not all of those that are done on that financial level that's bigger are a complete success. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? it's yeah, yeah. just the ones that resonate so i think that it's 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 great to just know that you can write a song and be a part of something that's really personal you know per, like it's really close to your person which can resonate out to people if, you, if you're a people person and you can also do something on a big scale to where you can take your your personal experiences with your friends and write a song globally about what you're doing like what bam Margera did with jackass he just let everyone know this is what me and my friends are about. They weren't trying to act or, you know, they were just truth, isn't it? Yeah. Just truth. You mentioned the goats a moment ago, Chuck. Did you play, am I right in thinking this? Did you play Woodstock 94, that crazy year when it all went off? Did you play that with them? I, um, we played, yeah, the first year that it came back, that wasn't the crazy. It wasn't, it wasn't the wild one. Yeah, it wasn't the one after that. That was when it was still kind of like forming and, there was corporate things, but it wasn't as, I don't know why there was such a corporate backlash amongst people that were going to shows. I just, I, there was just, there was just a lot of, they felt, the people that ran Woodstock felt weird even having corporate sponsorships at the one that we were at in 94. They just felt weird. And I was like, why? You know, this is, I mean, the grounds were huge. I mean, the, the people, tents and the people everywhere mud everywhere you know what i mean like they were just calm with it so i think you would want those people having money but they were still bickering about it so the year after we played was when there was some water issue and 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 how much it cost and these kids were just more angst about fighting back yeah towards that system you know our year was more about you know, the local bands getting exposed to playing in front of 125,000 people because people just wanted to be in the crowd. You know what I mean? So it was, that was our thing. I think that, you know, just the whole Limp Biscuit thing and where, where those bands come from, it's more like taking that energy and just snapping it, maybe at the right or wrong times. At a fest, it's hard to snap energy because if it goes the wrong way, people go, they can just go through the roof. And that, to me, I know that probably bummed those people out that, that ran Woodstock. That was probably the hardest thing for them to deal with because they're responsible for everyone that's on their grounds. You know what I mean? They're liable. You know, that's, I wouldn't want to go. I wouldn't. That, that must have sucked for them. It's heavy duty, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's weird. You know what I mean? Because it's a lot. It's a lot. And it's a, it's a memory. And it's, it's, it's filmed. And it's, it's so vivid. And what was going on It's just like, well, if, if we had a way to keep certain festivals like Woodstock or, or, or miniature versions of Woodstock all about the communities so we don't have to worry about this backlash, that would be great because it's, it's great to go to a, an amazing festival and have a good time and not see any violence. You know, a little fight here is whatever, drunk people, whatever, yelling, but a, a full-blown thing where people are running around and fearing for their lives, it's like not everybody's cut out for that. No. It's going yeah. And as you say, you can't control it. Even the act on stage, once it reaches a certain point of no return, yeah. it's very hard, even with a microphone, to shut that situation down, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, you know, the, 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 it's like a, it's like a motorcycle engine powered, you know, of tone coming at you through that PA. So if there's their energy screwed up, I mean, 
you know, that's being magnified. And it's not that those guys are doing it on purpose. It's just that you, if you're going to do something to just get people excited, just hope. I would always want people to keep their excitement close to where the energy is. But if there's anywhere that people want to go and let off an attack because somebody's doing something or saying something or directing something, you know what I mean? That That's where, to me, it just gets kind of scary. You, know what I mean? yeah. you, you want your crowd safe. If you're getting that many people to come and see you, the thing in my mind would be keep everyone safe. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's heavy to be around 125,000 people. You know what I mean? It, it's a lot. Things can go wrong quick. You know what I mean? <laughs> One of my favorite bands who still have this unpredictability about them on that mass scale, I think a lot of bands, once they hit arena level, it becomes a lot more, you know, planned out and rehearsed and predictable. Pearl Jam, for me, are a band that are still magical and in the moment, and every show seems to be unique and special. How many shows did you get to do with them? How did that situation come about? And, and how was that for you connecting with a band of that level and, and getting to do? the thing with them <laughs> well yeah um sitting in with um the guys from pearl jam and mud honey for their green river tribute it was somewhere in, in vegas or nevada somewhere i'm tripping right now but it was a lot it was a lot of fun they made a decision to be like hey chuck if you want to play drums on a song do it here's it's this is our first band you know dave will show you the song and, and I learned it and it was great. It was fun. It wasn't like it was a, a huge plan. It was just like a fluke of a, of a, of a fun time. But um, I was on tour playing bass for Urge Overkill. And we were on tour uh, with Pearl Jam while, who was it? Um, the Breeders were on tour with Nirvana. Wow. At that point, yeah, it was a crazy time. because at what that a time. Point, yeah, they were both they were both doing like five thousand seaters, and there was a little bit of a fun kind of back and forth competition, you know, because everyone know knows each other and bands have toured with each other, so it was kind of wild. But just watching us play with Pearl Jam and having to step our setup was great, but watching Eddie and all those guys interact on stage, like. Like when you when you see it from the front, it's crazy. When you see it from the side of the stage, it's crazier because you see the the, the chemistry. You know what I mean. And, and more than me sitting in with them, what I what I got from that tour was learning that a bunch of snowboarders and skateboarders from Seattle who just learned how to do their band and the light guy learned to do his thing and the sound guy. All those guys learned their position. I, I don't know what they did with the bad brains did. What Bad Brains did with punk rock, they did with like, I don't want to say alternative, with rock and roll because Pro Jam is now considered a rock and roll band. So mm. they're like I'll, the Who, aren't they now? Yeah, yeah, it's amazing because they've that's that that formula of of, of not knowing. But it's just that there's something about that skateboarding glue glue that happens, and once the band is kind of glued in around that, it just kind of sticks because everyone's kind of doing the same thing. And you have all the friends doing the same thing. Oh, there were so many great bands that, that came out from that time. Pearl Jam, to me, had the, I think, the long-lasting approach to just relate to people who, who love fun music. You know what I mean? It, yeah, it, it's it, wild, man. Like, you look at filmmakers as well. You mentioned Bam a moment ago, and obviously Jackass was like Big Brother, CKY, and Spike Jones. And obviously Spike Jones is now one of the most, you know, yeah. incredible successful filmmakers harmony corin as well and, and so many photographers and fashion designers and chefs and i think that you know that community really bred a lot of artistic creative but also grounded people that mm -hmm. could go into various forms of the arts and and develop their voice but you know remain true and connected to the source and bring yeah. people from that community with them along for the ride and build something really you know unique and special that connects with people no matter how big it gets, because it yeah. comes from that true place. Yeah, new characters. New characters were needed. <laughs> <laughs> well, because of, because of what was going on in the eighties when things were getting a bit too over the top. I guess so. There's things are just getting you know worn out, and you know it's like you, you call something you know new wave, and and bands just get louder and grungier, and you know 
we all could have just bought an MC5 record and been like, oh, this has been done forever. Yeah. You know, the, the early Stooges record, but not everybody's hip to just what it is. So we all have to kind of reinvent and re recreate. You know what I mean? So it's just fun times. You know what I mean? It's a lot of learning. You are right as well. I had Wayne Kramer on the show a while back, and I was like, the, the MC5 and the Stooges, you can stop right there. You know, Nirvana were an incredible band, but all they were really doing was what, as you just said, the Stooges and MC5 had already done. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's kind of funny because it's, and it's, I don't think musicians are banking on it, but people just leave so much open with music to, 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 to be discovered that bands could actually get influenced by an, you know, an, an undiscovered band create their own vibe and, and make it universal and people won't even know what, where it's coming from. You know, I mean? The fact that we didn't know about the Stooges and MC5 as a thing, what we all knew about Led Zeppelin, even black people I knew knew about Led Zeppelin. Like it was weird that like when I started going back and combing what the whole Detroit sound was about, I was like, oh, this is weird. Like these guys did it. Like they had all the soul and they had all the, the angst and they weren't really preaching. You know what I mean? It still sounded great. So out of step with the '60s free love time as well, wasn't it? It was like yeah, the yeah. polar opposite of that. I was like, "Fuck, mm -hmm. fuck your hippie movement!" Like we want yeah. to burn this shit down. Yeah. And then those guys spawned death, death becoming a band. You know what I mean? You know, the all black band that's from you know from Detroit. Yeah, those guys I've seen the documentary about them. Great, mm -hmm. great band, great story, and yeah. yeah, and Detroit man. There's something about I've never been there myself, but fascinated with. And, and later on, obviously, with Jack White and people like that and the Dirt Bombs, like there seems to be, I don't know, there's like a rawness, isn't there, to Detroit rock and roll? Yeah, I, I think that like going there and hanging out is just kind of raw, but for some reason, even the Motown guys, like the fact that most of these guys are still playing through amps and, and, and having to play different size venues, and there was always this kind of push to make it bigger than life live because you didn't have all the like, the tricky sound things and the, you know the, the the funny pedals all everything was all tube gear so it just seemed like detroit bands and that whole thing that's what jack white and those guys suck off on is because it's it's it is real there's nothing there's no fluff in it it is rock and roll with just soul music behind it because it's hard to keep a band tame and play for twenty thousand people it has to start exploding you know what i mean it's, it's got to do something different you know detroit is perfect for it how much fun was it jamming with Scream? Um, Pete Stiles, a character that I definitely want to get on this show at some point. Um, he's in a band Earthlings with my buddy Davey Catching. Um, obviously, you know, Dave Grohl was famously in that band early on. I guess he now tour manages or did pre-COVID and will again tour manage yeah. Rival Sons right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's been working with those guys for a while. Yeah, to, like to jam with Scream because they're a childhood hero band for me and I saw those guys back in the day and we played shows with them back in the day. But to get to play the songs that I grew up on with those guys and have his brother Franz play. Guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was good. I was Skeeter. You know what I mean? It's just wild. It's like being in a like a Wizard of Oz moment. You know what I mean? It's like, whoa, there, oh, there is Skeeter. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm, you hear a song and you're playing it and you, you remind yourself that you're a kid, but then you're like, the person standing right there you know what i mean and it's just the environment was wild because th those songs really relate to a lot of people you know what i mean the still yeah. screaming record and other songs around that still screaming record really hits home for a lot of a lot of folks as far as like that was a record that changed my life you know what i mean so that's what i felt playing with them i was like this, these guys helped me become a better songwriter a better guitar player better you know because it wasn't just like you know, there was some melody about it and you've been jamming with the bedouin sound clash guys um i met them a couple of years back on tour with my friends the skints and we went out for some drinks is it eon yeah eon and jay mm -hmm. good Those dudes man cool. yeah yeah we did a record together and did some touring together it was super fun those guys were super talented you know we were in new orleans recording the record and that was completely fun because it was during the summer so it was as hot we were just working every day, seeing the wildest shit, being in New Orleans. But their shows, playing with those guys, because it's a three-piece band, sometimes yep. one or two people, they still put out a, a lot of volume, you know what I mean? It's, and, and, and 
still keeping it raw and kind of reggae kind of world beat. And I, I like that. It does a, a younger crew of musicians taking on this kind of like talking heads. Yeah, approach. man, I can hear that. It's it's it, doing the record with them was super fun. James is a great writer, and he's just he's a dad now too. He just had, How many uh, kids have you got, Chuck? Three, four, four. Wow. Yeah, two boys, two girls. Oh man, you're a busy dude. I mean, so let me ask you this: How do you juggle all the bands that you're in, all the projects that you do, with the family home life? Because there seems to be a lot of, of, of projects and kids going on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, my son, I'm, I'm with my younger son most of the time now. Well, my oldest son is living in New York. You know, my daughters are fine, you know, with their families. And so it's even when when everybody, you know, was around, you know, when they're younger, just I was able to just keep my self-employed life. It was way more scatterbrained than like, most of my friends wanted to because most of my studio friends didn't want to go and do session work or then or then most of my studio guys didn't want to go do weddings or bat mitzvahs or whatever. So I was able, because to watch my dad's band, to apply that to like, well, if I can just stay a loose cannon as much as it drives people crazy, I can kind of flip flop my time schedule and make sure that I'm around as much as possible. You know what I mean? So it, there is a way to do it. It's just that most musicians just they just they, they put too many hangers up to me you know what i mean in the closet and and hang hang the, the guilt coat on it to me where it's just like the only thing that i physically can't do is do blast beats by double, double bass drums other than that i can pretty much handle any sort of music task because i wouldn't want to be left out of an opportunity where i could learn you know what i mean it's, and that's the one thing about making sure that you can feed your family or feed your artist self that if you apply yourself to every aspect of the music even taking in some time and just learning how to tour manage or, or learning how to roadie i've roadie for the bad brains for almost a year straight and it was great because i learned how to like operate a football size at the gorge it is a huge stage it's like a damn basketball size stage and it was cool that like if you have respect for other people's property and the other stage hands outside of being the artist you actually get more respect because they'll help you move everything off your off the stage. A big show production becomes a happy family of people of just working together as like just kind of like this grunt mentality of like, okay, let's do this. When I've seen other bands go on stage and act like rock stars, yeah. piss the flies off, and then all hell breaks loose. You know, so it's the whole the whole thing for me, and I don't know if I got off on a tangent, but I just to learn. Not at all. To, to learn every aspect of what's important in music because there's so many dynamic people doing creative things. And I've met some of my favorite musicians that, that have wanted nothing to do with getting on stage. They just wanted to go and be around music, be more in the backdrop of it. You know what I mean? For some well, it's good to be able to do all of it as well because then you're more employable, right? So if you've got all yeah. the skills of on stage, in the studio, on the road, yeah. then you know that you're always going to get work. And you can stay connected to what you enjoy being around and, and remain inspired by it. Because I think so many people, because they're not flexible, have to just give up on the pursuit of music as a professional path altogether because they need stability. And yeah. it's like, no, if you leave yourself open, then you can remain employed by doing what you love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess always be excited because there's always new challenges on the horizon. Yeah. And it's a, it's a little crazy. And, 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 and certain people, shouldn't force yourself to do it it should be something that you want to do or it should be something that if you're experiencing different music like every genre of music has its experts and every genre has its you know people people that are just trying and just learning and if those people can meet up at those right times it's great it's just normally when you're getting into a new music you're and you're starting to get introduced to the musicians you're you're, you're people that are already at 100 miles an hour yeah. So unless you really done your homework, it could be embarrassing. And that, that part of it sucks. But you could actually learn how to do basic things in music with those people, which is it, it's hard for all of those people to communicate because everyone's too shy. You know what I mean? They're just, mm -hmm. they're, they're, I got to be amazing now. And it's like, no. <laughs> you know, it, it should be more like taking care of your ears if you're going to be a musician. You know what I mean? Like, Making sure you get like an athlete would look after their, you know, muscles or whatever. It's yeah, the yeah. same thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 
one thing we neglect because of, of, of the trial and error of they'll hang in there for so long. But it does change your life when you start noticing you can't hear certain things, or are you going to a, ear, you know, an examination you know, for your ears and they show you the graph where you've lost all your high end. You know, it's kind of scary. So, and that happened to me a long time ago. So, <laughs> it's, <tough. laughs> it's it is what it is. It's, it's already happened. Uh, the, I guess the final thing I wanted to ask you, my friend. Thanks so much for for coming and hanging out on the show. It's been great talking to you and getting to know you. And um. I wanted to ask, just as like somebody who's super across the board with so many, obviously genres, you have to be adept as a player to be able to play in all these different groups. But the session musicians and the kind of prolific guest musicians that I know, have to, you have to be really adaptable as a human being to slot in with all kinds of different personalities and band dynamics. And you essentially have to be like a super cool person because you wouldn't get work in all these different bands if you weren't really easygoing. And I guess if you could just sort of reflect a bit on what you've learned about the adaptability of the human mind in different scenarios and how that served you as a musician in your life. Like, cause it must be a trip going from, you know, working with hip hop guys to the bad brains to urge overkill to Pearl jam. These are very different groups of people. So how are you able to, you know, dance between these <laughs> these bands so seamlessly, Chuck. What is it in you? Do you think that makes you a good session musician? Um, I think that uh, I've I've never been able to push the eject button and and have any sort of um, problem on the road become like it's unhealthy. You know, for for the entire you know posse or crew of people that's touring. You know, because if, if we're all together as 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 a as a unit driving and a lot of those tours we've all had to kind of like share the wheel you know regardless of what was going on or someone was too drunk or someone was whatever or someone had some emotional things they got to work out with family you know so I, I wanted always I was always wanting to keep the crew tight because I have heard stories of people not coming home from tours and and, and then it's not about if you're getting along or not it's just that someone made the wrong decision driving and didn't see something and they flipped and the trailer was flipped and now them and the whole, you know, squad has either lost their lives or people are paralyzed. And, you know what I mean? I've, I've gotten all sorts of phone calls. And so it's, that to me has made me humble myself versus being picky about, am I going to emotionally be, you know, uh, kind of like a, a jock who stow of everyone's emotions. You know, I'm not a deep sea diver into people's people's things you know i've tried that but it's not really my space to operate someone else's backyard you know what i mean it's like i'm playing drums and skateboarding and playing and even even singing and writing just basic punk songs i mean that's a lot that you have to deal with if you really want to connect with it just most people get bored of it because of the work ethic you mm -hmm. know what i mean it's yeah 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 you can get the blast and it's great and that's what i think spoils the dynamic with people in every sort of music, who's there for the blast, who's there for the long haul. And, and most people, not everybody has to be around and be creative for the long haul. And that's the hardest thing for a creative person that has a lot of sensitivities or emotional sensitivities to relate to, that you're going to have to be creative with people that may not have as much heart as you do with what you want to do, you know? So that's, it's either you're gonna be a boss or be the session person that goes along with the crew until someone says, hey, do you want to do something? Everyone's busy. Do you want to produce this thing? You've been with loyal with us. So here's a team bonus. You know, it's, it's, it's I think being a part of the team and learning how music is made is such an important journey for me because I was able to see it go from the analog stage to the pro tool stage and where it is now to where people can just set up a studio in their kitchen and start knocking out things you know what i mean it's like our our thing was great and it was prehistoric and it was amazing and i'm glad that we did enough things there to generate money for the future for it to be completely open to everybody so it's really not about color it's not you don't have to do shows if you want to make music you know before we were after pressure to get out in the limelight get out and travel with people you know it's just unnecessary behavior just to be known now people can just get on their computer and you don't have to really, if you get a racist comment, it's like, oh, I can delete you. 
you know, you don't have people throwing things at you or, you know, people spitting on you or, you know, whatever, someone slamming into you or beer going into your face or, you know, you, you, have, you gotta have to love all that. I yeah. think a lot of people were forced into going to shows because it was cool versus like they really didn't want, they didn't really want to be there because not everybody has a great time of chaotic, chaotic situations. You know what I mean? It's like, and depending on what we do and how we deliver ourselves back to people, it, it that makes people go, yeah. Do you still enjoy the chaos? Are you still attracted mm. to the unpredictable nature of, you know, the skate scene, the music community, rock and roll, punk rock, hip hop, yeah, art with an edge? Yeah, I mean, a good, a good, a good circle pit when you're playing the right beat. You know what I mean? It's yeah, it feels great because a, a part of it reminds you of where you were as a kid if you were there, being an adult playing music still and still being able to play really good punk rock music, which is great, which is basically aggressive country music is what punk rock music is, aggressive blues music. You know, it's just, ah, it's heavy. You know, there's a lot. There's a lot. I'm, I'm totally losing, totally where I was with the, with the whole comment. But, <laughs> You're so still it, into it, though. Tell, tell, me, tell me again <laughs> one more time so I can... I just back. wanted to know if you were still attracted to the danger and excitement of rock and roll. Yeah, I, I miss I miss the crowd, um, the connection of the crowd because playing different instruments for me, I know what it's like to stand in a crowd and feel what a bass player is doing, or feel what a guitar player is doing, or do whatever. I have the chance to go backstage and look at what people are doing. Like that whole intimate part of music sucks because that's that's where everyone used to learn when they would travel and see, be like, oh my god, I just saw this drummer or whatever. You know what I mean? Where it's at now, it's it's kind of sketchy. You know what I mean? It's I, I, I think the the rawness of it is 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 where where it should be. You know what I mean? It's it's it's, it's I, I think that the technical part of it should take itself away. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now COVID makes everybody you have to be a professional musician. You have to be very you know politically correct about what you're saying. You can get shut down if you're doing a live stream and you say something that's not appropriate to the person who's hosting your live stream because you haven't thought it out to own your live stream to say aggressive things. You know, it's it's uh, that part of it is wild. You know what I mean? And everybody's filming anyway. You know what I mean? I just I I hope that it can get back to just regular the people who really want to keep it theater. We should be able to have some kind of status quo lifestyle to do that so no one has to get sick yeah and i think just like going back to living off grid i think there's a lot to be said for that like as as powerful and useful and positive as social media is for promoting your art whatever you do and you can be independent and that that's your platform to share what you do but i think there's something to be said for just throwing the phone away and just going out and having a good skate or losing yourself at a good show or yeah. hanging out with your friends and just connecting yeah. on that raw level that I think the digital age has sort of removed a little bit, but I'm yeah. old school like that. I think. No, no, it's just, it's, it's it's completely removed from it being organic to being more more visual and more more like everything is a quick anthem mm-hmm. versus like we had to figure out why we were even inspired by the anthem, our our way of it because you had to, there's a trial and error that may have not worked out for you. If you don't like something now, you could just drop and drag and flick and you're onto a whole nother. You know, it's like a, it's like a big Rolodex of, of of entertainment versus like, are you really intrigued by the lifestyle that you're choosing right now? Does it really resonate? My choices doing that with skateboarding and punk rock and all that. Yeah, I mean, it was. I couldn't do anything else. My grades were horrible. Everything sucked because it wasn't pop mm-hmm. music. You know, what I mean? it was. I just didn't have that. I couldn't split the, the worlds. I wanted to get out of high school to just and, and steady play music. And you did it, man. And you're still doing it. So it's fine. And I wouldn't suggest people to do that because you don't like what the systematic approach is. I mean, there's so many online schools right now where you can go and learn. I just know that the business part of it and the songwriting part of it relating to like what is there is so important to know. So if people are struggling with that, it's worth it to take some courses in the the skeletons of what music is, the creative side and the business side. And then you can get out there and hopefully make a life and a 
living out of doing what you love, right? And then you never have to work a day in your life. I guess so. Yeah. If, you, if you're a <laughs> businessman, you got to get on. Yeah, it's you got to be a good talker now. You got to hire a good person to speak. I babble too much, so it's hard for me to get on and say, buy my product. Wah, 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 wah. But <laughs> it, it does work because it's a part of people's time to look at a phone and, and get consumed in someone else's character for a moment. Just to, to think, oh, I would like to buy that. You know what I mean? So it's that's we didn't have to do all that before. Before we were behind the, the curtain. Now everyone's, you know, the social media thing is blowing it out so far that you have to stay at a certain level to be noticed. You know what I mean? It's kind of crazy. Well, I'll say this. If anybody's looking to get into McRad in particular, I think the Begin record is a cool place to start because the level of guests on that and, and the different musical pockets which you delve into, you know, from hardcore to reggae, it's all there. And you've got like Dean Ween and Roger from Agnostic Front and Tommy Guerrero's on there and Daryl from Bad Brains. This is a sick record, man. Um, you know, there's about 20 songs on there, so there's a lot. And I think there's enough there to sort of get into what you do on every musical level. Even hip hop, there's everything going on. Is that a yeah. fun record to do? Freddie Fox, yeah, because yeah, he's, he's Freddie. Knuckles, yeah, he's he's just the, his inspiration from what he's done with you know Gangstar and Guru and all the whole thing. And it was good because I took and did some editing to it. Also, it wasn't just like I didn't really play any instruments on it other than maybe a guitar line or something. But I was just tripping about. I was being more Pink Floyd with his voice and the track itself and. And he ended up liking it, so I thought it was good. So I was, I was in the engineering at the time. So that record, for because of the amount of songs, is because I was engineering all that stuff myself and learning how to. I just wasn't missing it, and I drove my friends crazy. To <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. This has been great, man. Thanks so much. I've loved Thank it. You um and uh yeah I, I hope that when the world's re-up and open and running again hopefully you make it over to the uk whether it's with tommy or whoever it's with and um we'll link up man and where's yeah. home for you you still living in philadelphia i'm in the ba right now well if i ever get to that part of the world i'll look you up as well man yeah come through <laughs> thank you chuck well, you take you. care have a great day and yeah. um i'll let you know when this goes up man and i'll get you the link and stuff cool thanks man cheers dude that was really good fun Thanks, man. Bye-bye. Two different, let me tell you something. I can go on forever. So I'll go my way, way.